Martin. Tonight's program is tied to postcards from Mecca. And our guests, we have three guest presenters tonight, Warner Graves III, Ron May, and Steve Leck. And all three contributed essays uh, to the book. And uh, this is the book that started it all. It's called, the full title is Postcards from Mecca, the California Desert Photographs of Susie Keefe Smith and Lula May Graves. And I'm happy to say that we have copies of this in our gift shop. Uh, so uh, when you when you stop by to visit the show, uh, you might want to pick up a copy of the book. It's a wonderful, wonderful read. There are six or seven essays in the in the book, and we have three of our contributors here tonight, and they will each be uh, touching on a different aspect of Lula May Graves and Susie Keith Smith's life and the meaning of their work. We're going to start uh, with Warner Graves, uh, and uh, Warner is the grandson of Lula May Graves, and he is an established decorative artist and landscape painter. Uh, he resided for a while in the uh, Bay Area, but he now lives in uh, the Southern, Southern California desert area. Um, uh, Warner, exactly where, where do, you, do you live like in the Coachella Valley now? Oh, you're muted. There. Yeah, there you go. Um, I live in an area called Snow Creek, uh, kind of north of Palm Springs. Uh, at, the base, at, at the base of Mount San Jacinto. Got it, okay, wonderful. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, Warner is, among other things, a, a wonderful landscape painter. Uh, and he has um, revisited many of the places that his grandmother photographed over 100 years ago. That, that's pretty cool. Um, as a child, he grew up hearing stories about Lula May and Susie's adventures, and even visited Cor the Corn Springs Oasis, which is featured in the exhibition. And I was re-looking at the book tonight, Warner, and I, I remember that uh, you, you recount that you spent a chilly New Year's Eve night right. mm -hmm. at Corn Springs. Yes. And I also might add that many of the photographs that are in the exhibition are from uh, Warner's uh, private collection. Thank you uh, for that introduction, David. Um, uh, I thought I'd give a, I, I'm honored, of course, to have Susie and Lula's photos uh, there at the Grace Hudson uh, Museum. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know the background, I'll give a very brief summary. Uh, these two individuals are Susie Keith Smith and her cousin, Lula Mae Johnson Graves. They're in the sombrero. Uh, that's also my grandmother. Uh, Susie and her family had a small farm uh, located near the Salton Sea, near a town called Mecca in the southern Coachella Valley. Um, and they were both avid photographers. Susie invited her cousin to come out from Tennessee to come visit for a couple weeks. My grandmother came out and ended up staying for a much longer time. She basically moved there. And uh, the two of them uh, joined forces, uh, traveled around the California desert, uh, pistol in one hand, camera in the other, and documented their exploits. I'm also, as uh, was mentioned, the co-editor along with Ann Japanga of the book, Postcards from Mecca. Uh, we published the book in late 2018, early 2019. Uh, I corresponded with uh, the show at the uh, La Quinta Museum in the Coachella Valley. It's a traveling exhibit. The Grace Hudson is the second part of that tour, um, and it'll uh, go to other destinations um, in the future. Uh, so that's enough about the present. Let's talk about the past. Uh, my grandparents settled in uh, San Jacinto, which is in Riverside County. They had a small farm. And my sister and I would spend our summers out there. That's me, and that's my little sister. Uh, we would be babysat by our grandmother. Uh, we grew qu quite close to her. That's me and Lula May. Um, she lived to 100, so I knew her well into my adult years. And as I mentioned, she was an avid photographer. Uh, and on hot summer days, she would invite us indoors to look at her photo albums. And for anybody who doesn't know, in the past, in ancient times, when you had a photo, you would often put it in a photo album. That was a way to share it with your friends. So we would sit there on either side of our grandmother. And of course, being kids, we had a million and one questions about the people and uh, the subject matter in, the, in, in her photo albums. And uh, she was a great storyteller and a very patient person. 
She was an adventurous woman. Um, here she is as a co-pilot along with Susie. Uh, they did uh, a series of aerial photographs. She also spent some time in Hawaii. My grandfather was stationed in Pearl Harbor, so she was witness to the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But as a young child, it was those sepia-toned photos that really made an impression on me. Um, and the, the adventure tales of my grandmother and Susie in the California desert made a lasting impression. Some of the photos were very tongue in cheek, uh, people just out there having a good time. Other ones were more serious. This is my grandmother uh, give, uh, uh, being given a tour uh, by one of the prospectors out there in the middle of nowhere. And then of course, there's the beautiful landscape photographs taken by Susie. Uh, we'll hear more about that from Steve later. Uh, my grandmother, like I said, lived to 100. And so when she passed away, my father inherited uh, quite a bit of my grandparents' personal items, which he promptly packed away, put everything in storage up in our attic where it sat for several years. Uh, then fast forward, my sister and I are tasked with having to empty out our parents' house. And every time we'd open up a box of any of our grandparents' stuff, it was uh, just magical. I mean, here's some uh, Navajo blankets they had purchased in uh, Arizona in the 1930s. I remember them having these draped all over their furniture. Uh, my grandparents were big rock hounds, so there were all kinds of minerals and rocks and mining artifacts. Lots of, lots of uh, Native American um, artifacts. You can see a basket up there. Um, old maps, mining leases, pith helmets, anybody who enjoys uh, desert history. I mean, this was a real treasure trove to uncover. Uh, my grandmother was also a part-time painter, so it was fun coming across her paintings. Um, but really, uh, it was those several boxes of her photos uh, that was so magical to come across. I hadn't seen any of these images uh, when we unpacked them. I hadn't seen any of them for probably 20 or 30 years. And um, you know, all my memories of my grandmother and all the the story, all her stories and adventures of, with her and Susie in the California outback came flooding back to me. But of course, um, I was an adult uh, when I rediscovered all these images, and I realized that both Susie and Lula May, my grandmother, were um, very accomplished uh, photographers. And the more I researched it, I saw that they had documented a way of life um, and a region of California uh, during a particular era that uh, was not very well documented or recorded. It was a real snapshot in time there in the Colorado and Sonora Desert. So what to do with the photographs? I really didn't know. Um, it felt criminal on my part to put them back in a box um, where they would never see the light of day. I really wanted to share them with the world, share them with the public. Um, I didn't quite know what that meant or how to go about that. I also knew I only had half of the story. Uh, Susie uh, was a major component of all my grandmother's tales about uh, her desert adventures. She referred to Susie as the landscape photographer. So I was, I didn't know what had become of Susie and I had no idea what had happened to her photo archive. Um, so at, after a little bit of online sleuthing, I tracked down her photos and we'll hear uh, that Pretty amazing story from Ron in a little bit, how her photos were saved, uh, but they're housed nowadays in Goffs, G-O-F-F-S, which is in the Mojave Desert at the MDHCA, stands for the uh, Mojave Desert Historical Cultural Association. Um, and uh, after you know, a, a year or so of correspondences with the MDHCA, they put me in touch with Anne, and. Uh, was living in uh, is living in Palm Springs. She's a writer and she has an online magazine called California Desert Art. She had seen Su Susie's photos and she had written a couple articles about them. So I met with Anne. We agreed to work together um, on the book. We put out the book uh, with the several con uh, contributors um, and uh, put together the show down in La Quinta. And it was such a success that we decided to uh, hit the road with it. So who was Lula May? Um, you can guess by her name that she's from the American South. She grew up in Tennessee on Lookout Mountain uh, in Chattanooga near the Georgia border. 
She lived a, uh, in a house on the side of the mountain, as she called it, with her older brother pictured here and her mother. Their father had died when they were children, so it was just the three of them. And she really relied and looked up to her older brother, but he left at a very early age. I want to say age 14. I think he lied about how old he was because he was so tall and he joined the Marines. So that just left uh, my grandmother and her mom in this big house. Uh, the two of them did not get along, kind of a typical teenage story. Her mom had uh, expectations that her daughter would marry and raise a family uh, locally, uh, but that's really not what my grandmother wanted to do. Um, I think she couldn't wait to uh, uh, see the world. Uh, here's a childhood photo of my grandmother, but I love it because it kind of sums her up. She was a bit of a, uh, a wild child. Uh, she was very adventurous, uh, very inquisitive, um, and very creative. And first chance she got to come to California at Susie's invite, she did. This is a photograph of my grandmother taken by Susie, uh, you know, probably a year or so into her stay down there. You can see she's very, uh, um, she's uh, living the life that she uh, always wanted to. There's the mountains in the background that form uh, the southern border of jo uh, what's now Joshua Tree National Park. She had originally planned on coming only for two weeks, um, ended up uh, staying. Um, I like this, the, this is a card she sent to her mom. It says, send all mail to Mecca. We'll explain later, Lula May. <laughs> uh, I know, I think that's very funny. So she ended up staying in California, except for that short period where she was in Hawaii. She stayed in California her whole life. And a good chunk of that was spent out in the desert. Uh, and she eventually made amends with her mother and her mom uh, moved to California as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, Susie and my grandmother uh, did was they would, on the back of each photo, they would uh, put the individual, uh, the date the photo was taken, and the location. And so because of that, I know this was taken just a couple days after she arrived in Mecca from Tennessee. As you can tell, she has on a summer dress, something she probably would have worn there um, uh, in Chattanooga, um, a bonnet, and some not very comfortable looking uh, shoes. They don't look like they would uh, last more than an hour or two out there in the desert. Someone's given her a snake. Uh, she seems rather nonplussed about it. Um, but it reminds me of a story she told about coming out west on the train from Tennessee. She said nobody would look at her, nobody would make eye contact with her, and nobody would sit next to her because she was a single woman traveling alone, um, some kind of holdover of Victorian morality. And then they, she, she pulls into the train depot there in Mecca, and there's all these cowboys on horseback firing pistols in the air to announce the arrival of the train. Uh, so you can imagine uh, what a contrast that was, um, her entry into the Wild West. So like I said, this photo was taken shortly after she arrived. The next photo is um, after she'd been there for a couple weeks. So there you see, uh, that's Lula May in all her glory. Um, and that's really the grandmother I grew up knowing. Uh, she, uh, she loved all things Western. She loved Native American culture. She really found herself there in the desert. Um, um, you know, I, I love that you can see the holster there. Uh, those are a bunch of hand-me-down clothes from some of the local cowboys. And of course, what an exotic world this would have been um, coming from Tennessee. Uh, this is a postcard, one of Susie's postcards. It says the Black Tent near Indio, Coachella Valley, California. Uh, I imagine this is probably a roadside attraction. And um, of course, the 1910s, 20s, and 30s was a, a, a big uh, an era of a lot of change. It was the, the Old West was kind of fading from view, and what was replacing it was the automobile. I think both Susie and Lula were aware of that, and they, they sought out to kind of document some of these relics of a bygone era. And of course, we still have cowboys today, but uh, this is a cowboy that they befriended. And, um, Manuel Nelson, uh, I think he's the one who handed a lot of his uh, secondhand clothes to my grandmother. This is a shot of Main Street Mecca. Um, I like it because you can, it's one of the rare photos where you can actually see Susie's leg brace. Um, as mentioned earlier, she had childhood polio. Uh, so she wore uh, her, the, the, her whole life, she had a leg brace that went from her foot to her hip. Um, so she had that disability, but it obviously uh, didn't hold her back. 
And of course, surrounding them was the vast unexplored California desert. Uh, here they are in Susie's Model T Ford um, in a slot canyon. This again is Main Street there in Mecca. You can see the post office on the left where Susie was the uh, postmaster. Uh, this is the 1920s. Uh, you can imagine that by the 1930s, a site like this no longer really existed, replaced by the automobile. And uh, of course, the desert's a harsh environment. Uh, my grandmother said they would occasionally come across sites like this. This was a prospector who had died from um, lack of water. Um, I live in the desert and it gets very hot. I can attest to that. Uh, they were drawn to um, Native American culture. There was the Martinez uh, Reservation nearby. They, uh, they made friends with several individuals. And all throughout the desert, uh, there's these petroglyph sites. Uh, this particular one is in the Chuckawalla Wilderness at an oasis where they would spend a lot of their time. But they also had fun too. These are two prospectors with my grandmother there in the middle. Um, the man on the left, he also lived to 100. Uh, his name was Indian John, and he became a lifelong friend of my grandmother's. Here they are camping with uh, several uh, people who were working on the All-American Canal. This is the Depression, and so there's several WPA projects going on. Um, lots of Colorado River water diversions to feed the farms of Southern California and of course uh, Los Angeles and San Diego. So uh, they documented uh, uh, a lot of those people out there working on those projects, various projects. I think this is a, be a beautiful photo of Susie taking a walk with a gentleman. Um, it's one of the oases that you would have find tucked, uh, that you find tucked away in some of those desert canyons. Uh, I think this is a great portrait. This is one of the uh, uh, the individuals working on the All American Canal. This is a man called uh, Mr. Augustine. He was a prospector, lived a solitary life out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I kind of laugh to myself every time I see this photo. I think, what what must he have thought when he opened his door and he saw two young women? Um, appearing out of nowhere, asking if they could take his portrait. Um, must have seemed like quite a mirage. Again, here we have some of the surveyors uh, being entertained by a cowboy playing a harmonica. And there's all of Susie's uh, and my grandmother's beautiful landscape photos. So when the two of them were not working at the post office, there's Susie posing in front of the post office. Again, I, I, as I said, she was the postmaster. Or when they weren't, weren't working on Susie's parents' uh, farm, they were out exploring the desert, which is really, uh, that was their passion. Uh, there's Susie in the driver's seat, my grandmother posing, uh, uh, Susie's Model T Ford. They have everything you need to survive a few days out in the desert. You can see there's a shovel, lots of water, a rifle. My grandmother said they often got flats. I think it was almost daily occurrence. They also got around by horseback, um, although these are actually, um, I believe, burrows. That's Susie in the middle and my grandmother to the left. And I like to think, uh, you know, nowadays, if you travel down Highway 10 through the desert in Southern California, it's a vast expanse of uh, flat desert, but you can see some mountains in the distance. And if you squint your eyes and ever wonder what is out in those mountains, this exhibit and these photos um, offers a glimpse into that world, um, at least uh, uh, during that period. Um, this is a photo I remember uh, very well as a child. Uh, it's, uh, I have it enlarged and hanging on my wall at home. Um, it's just a, a, a really such a beautiful uh, uh, image of a, a dream life, uh, hanging out in a hammock uh, in an oasis in the shade. They have, uh, you can see their rifle right there leaning against them on the palm tree there. And with that, I'll uh, wrap things up. I just want to thank you for letting me uh, share my memories uh, and images uh, that my grandmother took. Here she is, uh, probably in her 90s, sitting on her back porch. Um, I think she'd got, gotten a real kick uh, knowing that uh, 
her photos were uh, uh, being shared and her stories were uh, being told to the public. I think she would have really loved that. So uh, again, thank you for uh, Grace Hudson for allowing me the opportunity and um, I will pass the torch on to, to Ron. All right, but before you do, Warner, I just yeah. have a couple of really quick questions about some sure. of the images here. Uh, the shot of the skeletal prospector, the bony yes. bones, uh, do you do you think that that was staged for uh, that the the lady staged that? Uh, <laughs> no, or, no, or, uh, um, I don't think so. Um, on the back of the photo, um, it says it was found by one of the um, uh, surveyors, um, and there's several in this series, and um, the bones got moved around for sure um, mm -hmm. in the different photos. But uh, no, I think it's a, I think it was a real individual. Okay, and then I also wanted to ask the the shot of the three women uh, on burrows. Yes. Uh, uh -huh. There's a rock that they're sitting in front of, and I I want to say it's called Uncle Sam Rock. Uh, that's uh, correct. It has that. Uh, Definitely looks like a profile of mm -hmm. something. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny. I am um, kind of as a side hobby. Um, I like to go to these places that they uh, adventured in and try and find some of these monuments. And this particular one, I have not been able to track down. I've gone looking for it twice. I've gone ca camping out there. I know it exists. I can find the mountains in the background, uh, but I just cannot find that particular rock. Um, um, but it's out there. I'll find it at some point. Okay, cool. Well, Warner, thank you so much. Uh, you'll be back towards the end if there is to uh, for the Q and A period. So uh, thanks for that wonderful presentation and those memories of your grandmother. Wow, what a special thing. Yeah, thank um, you very much. There is yeah. Ron now. Uh, let me uh, say a few words about Ron. Uh, Ron is a veteran archaeologist with a long list of experiences and accomplishments. Uh, he has been involved in a broad spectrum of historical, archaeological, and general environmental studies, uh, both in the state of California and also in Baja, California, in Mexico. Uh, he has authored some 70 publications on various related topics. He is a member of the esteemed Register of Professional Archaeologists and president and co-founder of Legacy 106, which offers a wide range of research and environmental services to private and governmental agencies. We, uh, we here at the Grace Hudson Museum as we've gotten to know the exhibition and Ron's essay in the book, uh, a great note is that he saved Susie Keith Smith's uh, images and uh, binders with photographs and other personal effects from oblivion. Uh, where they would have gone had, had no one found them in the dumpster that he rescued them from. So thank you for that, if nothing else, Ron. Uh, and so uh, without further ado. So let me, uh, before I get into my slides, talk a little bit about who I am. Now I've already been introduced and that saves me a lot of effort. I started doing archeology span in 1968 and uh, the only field school offered to me was the uh, Royal Presidio, an 18th century Spanish fort. So I got involved in historical archaeology almost immediately, uh, having to learn how to do historical research and at the same time interpret broken things that are buried in the ground, uh, crumbling architecture, and uh, the, the challenges of finding documentation that help us explain what we see in the ground. Um, so um, I've always been involved with historical documents. However, um, in the course of my career, I went into government first for the state highways, surveying land that eventually became freeways, and then later the county of San Diego, where I was uh, occupied the longest. Uh, and in that job, I worked in an environmental office that evaluated the impact of housing development and golf courses and highways and other things on what was out there in the remote areas of the County of San Diego. Um, and we dealt with things like um, mining camps, um, old barns, crumbling houses, as well as prehistoric archeological sites. Um, about 1986, or maybe it was a little earlier than that, I had to go back to school, to graduate school, 
and get training in what's called public archaeology for another assignment I had in my work. And I was very aware of the fact that there are thousands of documents being destroyed each year uh, by various government agencies who get control of people's property and focus on only the important thing, which is to care for the people who were unable to care for themselves. There was a, an office in my building. I worked in the planning department, but the public administrator's office was located in my building about a, an acre away from where I was. And they often would call me up and say, we have this estate. It was found in a flop house downtown. And there's these pictures, what should we do with them? Or there's Native American clothing or um, old diaries and things. And I would go over there and look through and advise them to send those do documents or photographs to different institutions. One day I was working in my office and a woman came in dragging this plastic bag with about 80 pounds of paper and asked me if I thought it was important. I looked at it and immediately realized these were photo albums and boxes of negatives and uh, letters and things. Um, and so I said, yes, I dragged it into my office. I said, where did you find them? She went, she led me to this dumpster out by the trash area and the dumpster was full of all kinds of people's documents. And it wasn't just Susie Keefe, it was also uh, other people. I mean, the, the deputies go through and they decide what they can sell and the rest goes in the dumpster. Um, and I was shocked to see the volume that was lost. There was no official contract or assignment for me to help the public administrator's office, but their deputies occasionally came to me with things that they thought were important. I would say that if you come away from this lecture today with no other message than your own public administrator's office is doing the same thing and someone needs to go out there and, and work with them to decide what's important in history and what's not. Otherwise, more history is gonna be lost. So I signed out for four hours of work for half a day and I went out to the dumpster and I pulled everything I could find that looked important that might be related to her. And some of these things were covered with jam and, and peanut butter and, and god awful stuff. It stunk like hell, but I took it all home and um, I cleaned it off as best I could. Um, and I found about five photo albums, um, boxes of photographs and negatives, an oil painting, and many pen and ink drawings of things like a bighorn sheep and, and scenery in the backcountry and all that. Yeah, still working on it. So um, anyway, those are things that I found. And, um, and uh, it took me, I have a longer story than this, but the short story is that after 10 years or so, I realized I was never gonna write the book that I was gonna thinking of writing. Um, I had many other projects in my life. So I donated three or four of the albums to a man named Russell Caldenberg, who worked for the Bureau of Land Management. And he was the one who donated them to that museum that, that Warder was talking about. Um, I held back some thinking I was still gonna write an article and uh, that never happened. So I mean, two or three years ago, Ann Japanga contacted me and I surrendered the last of my materials. Next slide. So uh, just to give you a feeling, I know that a lot of you are, I mean, you're in Northern California and we're down here in the South, but you can uh, look on maps or Google Salton Sea and get a sense of this area where we're talking about. Um, as an archeologist, I wanna to mention too, that I had gone to professional meetings for years where people showed photographs of landscapes as they are today and um, not how they were back in, in Susie's days. And I remember in particular photographs of Corn Springs with rows of rocks that were foundations of buildings, scatters of broken glass or broken pottery, but nothing as interpretable as what was in this collection. So there's a 
a photograph of Corn Springs, a page from Susie's, one of Susie's albums. And, uh, you know, she was there uh, at a time when things were still very intact. She also had photographs of prehistoric things. So the photograph on the right is a petroglyph um, found on the Salton Sea, but is actually on a, an ancient lake that's very dry now. Uh, the Salton Sea is a puddle compared to the gigantic Lake Kawea uh, that was out there then. Next slide. Um, and you've already been introduced to Susie as a young youngster, but I will tell you that in some of those collections that are in that museum, they also have photographs of her as a child with her parents in Los Angeles, and then when they moved out into the desert. And uh, there are many letters explaining the, the interaction of her family members and how they got along, how they didn't get along. Um, and I believe that a lot of the photos were taken when she and her father went out in the desert to explore and see what was out there. And they would shoot photos of buildings and, and wagons and the people who lived out there. I think at that time she had no idea how she could capitalize on that during the Great Depression. And this painting, by the way, uh, it was also in the dumpster. I pulled it out. And um, uh, that's how we believe she looked as a teenager. Next slide. But here's a typical box of, of things that I found in the dumpster or in the sack that the lady dragged in. I don't know exactly which. This. Uh, it was a cigar box um, issued by the Union Pacific Railroad. And that's significant in many ways in that um, Susie eventually married a man who worked for the railroad. And I know Warner's family has a different story about the man than, than I had believed when I read all read through the, the letters and the writing, writings on the back of the photographs. And I would say that each person who goes through these materials will interpret who these people were and how they interacted with their world differently. Um, there's many, many ways to see Susie uh, and, of course, Lula May. Um, but um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is again how I found the things you would see um, you know, little notebooks, uh, shopping lists, uh, little like. Um, diaries, indications of things that were happening in their lives at the time, envelopes of photographs, which she began at some point to arrange for commercial use. And I believe what happened was that um, she had these wonderful negatives in some photographs, some prints, but she learned that she could go down to San Diego, and I actually know which I forget at the moment, but there was a, a photo laboratory where she could take the negatives and order like 200 or 300 or 100 uh, prints on paper that was made or cardboard that was uh, intended for postcard use. And then those postcards were then marketed. I found two albums which were used to show to per prospective buyers. And you would flip through and there would be different postcard and you could she could uh, arrange ordering. They could order so many postcards from based on the photograph in that album. Uh, both albums, uh, Steve Leck has gone through and he'll be telling his story uh, in a few minutes. But I just want you to understand that I don't think she took the photos originally with the intent of making po postcards. I will tell you too, that I'm old enough to say that in uh, gas stations in the desert when I was a young person, I saw those same postcards for sale I don't remember the price. Um, also in Ocean Beach, that's a little town in San Diego. Uh, I remember a coffee shop with her photographs up on the wall of palm trees and things that you'll see here in some of the photos. Slide. And also uh, she befriended a great many people because she worked as the postmaster in Mecca. And as people who worked in the desert came to collect their mail or just to talk with her or to pick up magazines or whatever, she became friends with a great many people. In addition to the people who lived and worked out there, she had friends in San Diego. And many of them were soldiers and sailors and Marines. And um, so in one of the pages, one of the albums here, there was one of her friends 
received an air medal for his uh, feats in World War II. Um, next slide. There are so many stories I can't begin to tell them, but see that Corn Springs, uh, the photograph of Corn Springs, Wade's cabin. I think Wade was her cousin. Um, he was a World War I veteran, I believe. And again, in, if you went out there today, you might see a line of rocks that were the foundations of the buildings, but all the fabric, the, the wood and everything, it's gone now. So without, without these wonderful, precious photographs, we would never be able to interpret what we see. Um, next slide. Now, they didn't just live in the desert. There's this photograph on the uh, upper left of people standing by rocks at Catalina. That's actually an Avalon. And uh, there's the big rocks in the background. The small rock off to one side is, um, is where the, the casino is now. And so this photograph predated the building of the casino in the 1920s. Um, and you can tell by their costumes that they were, or their clothing, that it was quite a long time ago. Uh, next slide. And yeah, she had a fascination for snakes. I think some of the photographs were, were posed or staged for the shock value. The, the photograph of the skeleton in the desert, uh, people holding snakes, uh, brandishing guns, standing by wagons. That's all part of the, the, the stories that people like to tell about the desert. But there's also the private side, the kind of a, the personal life. This is a photograph of, of uh, one of Susie's, well, her Christmas in 1943 in her little trailer. You can see her tree and her artwork and her Christmas cards and very personal things. Next slide. Um, and she's famous for these landscape shots. Uh, Steve is going to explain it from his perspective. Uh, but I want to point out that this is the ancient beach line of the Lake Kawea. Um, mind you, you don't, probably don't know the difference between Salton Sea and Lake Kawea. Lake Kawea was like 100 miles long. It was this incredible body of water fed by the, the lower Colorado River. When the Colorado River overspilled, it filled into this ancient lake. Um, now it's dry. And then about 1906, there was a <coughs> breach of a, of a levee, and it filled in the body of water we now call the Salt Sea. And she was out there documenting this stuff. You can see by the writing, she knew she was on the ancient uh, beach line of that ancient lake. Next slide. Um, and again, Steve will treat these, old, these postcards uh, better than I can. But I do believe that, that she took advantage, she capitalized on her interest in landscape photography and uh, by creating these postcards that she could then sell. In addition to her income as a postmaster, uh, whatever income she had from her date farm that her family inherited, there were also, uh, there was a small amount of money, probably pennies for these postcards, but they're her legacy of today. And this is another one. Um, this is out in the Painted Gorge in Imperial Valley. All this is this landscape is with just a few miles from the uh, international border with Mexico. But these photos were taken at a time before there were off-road vehicles, before uh, General George Patton got out there and drove tanks all over the, the desert, before people were exploring uh, uh, mining gravels for uh, construction. This is a, a landscape that no longer exists today. Next slide. And also that she documented things that we don't really know. I mean, there's probably a whole story in this fellow, Harold Bell Wright, who lived in this home. I don't know what it is. I haven't researched him. Uh, it looks like he wrote The Winning of Barbara Worth. So people who were uh, interested in novelists, and this is a, a piece of history that could be used in some other research project. So, um, there's another slide that'll be coming up, but there's an area out in the Imperial Valley where uh, geothermal gases come up and form these mud plateaus or mud volcanoes and, and bubbling uh, 
you know, exotic ancient landscapes. It looks like something out of a dinosaur uh, picture, but uh, she had a sense for what would be interesting for other people. Next slide. And uh, this is, these are Akachoya and, and barrel cactus out in Imperial County. Next slide. And again, this is probably a building that no longer exists. The architectural style is called Pueblo Revival or maybe Mission Revival. And uh, somebody built this building, which is called Kenyon's Plunge. It's in El Centro. It probably, I, I'm sure it's not there now, but it's a wonderful example of uh, this Pueblo Revival architecture. For an architectural historian, seeing a building like this is exciting. And um, that's what I do now. I'm no longer active in archaeology. I do architectural history. So I'm excited to see this photo. Next slide. And here's the uh, mud volcanoes. This is where those geothermal gases have driven hot water up ab above air, up above ground, and created these volcanoes of mud. Um, and it's just an interesting thing. I'm not sure it's even there anymore. I think that probably modern construction is obliterated, but um, I hope, hope not. Hope this is not the last scene we're going to see of this material. Next slide. But see, so here's a good example of a, a photograph that she took of an interesting thing of the past. I have a feeling this slide, this, this negative or this photograph was taken before there was any thought of turning them into postcards. Um, but she re remembers that these were mine wagons in the Painted Gorge and probably used to haul ore, crushed ore from, from a mine, a gold mine or some other kind of mine. And they would bring it down to a place where they could stamp and crush it and then process it into whatever they were getting. But wonderful historical photos. And this brings me to the end. This was the, uh, the, the display that Warner talked about. Um, and uh, we, uh, my girlfriend Pam and I went down to, to see the, the end result of uh, what I hauled out of the dumpster. And, um, and I think that all, all of us have done a great service to the, the history that these two women have saved. And I would believe that there would be, there's enough material for several master's theses, maybe a PhD on the history of that part of uh, Southern California. There are so many things that happened down there. The All-American Canal brought water from the Colorado Desert. It's one of the most important things that happened in the early 20th century, uh, eventually bringing water to Los Angeles and the city of San Diego and many other places as well. Next slide. So I guess if nothing else, I, I had a role in keeping Su Susie alive. That's a saying that I have in my work. We bring people back to life that are otherwise forgotten. Of course, we can't bring them to life, but we can bring their stories out. And I hope you'll all get a copy of Postcards from Mecca and enjoy the stories that we have created out of her material. But just understand, there's a great many stories yet to be learned from these, from these papers left by these women. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Ron, before you before you turn your camera off, I just have to ask: in your in your long career, have you did you ever come across a a find such as this that's anywhere comparable to uh, Susie Smith's uh, Susie Keith Smith's uh, treasure trove of material? Anything we're, compared to that in your career? We're trying to come back to you right now, but I can say that uh, nothing on the volume or level of importance did I find. However, uh, one day just walking by the dumpster, I found photographs of an African-American man uh, wearing a, a graduation robe. And I ducked down and pulled out quite a bit of material on him. And it turned out that he was a, um, a valet for President uh, Roosevelt, um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And that material is in the San Diego uh, History Museum. And each year when they do the, the uh, Black History Month, you know, some of his material comes out. So I believe that everybody, every story I found 
has some level of contribution, but the volume of material that was thrown out by these public administrators is should be a lesson to everyone that the first thing you need to do on your next business day is to go down to your public administrator's office and work a deal with them to process through the material that they're getting because there are a lot of people out there that that end, it, end up life without children to care for them and their stuff is just being dumped in the dumpster and I think it's it's a crime. It's as bad as the other side of my profession when we see bulldozers going through archaeological sites or, or you know, dynamite blowing up uh, rock art. So yeah, that's that is my... a great. That's a, a wonderful lesson, Ron. History is around us all the time, and who knows how many wonderful stories have been lost to posterity because no one thought to save the material. Um, but we still that, have a chance. There's still stuff we, out there. We do, and I, I love being part of the museum profession because we provide a platform, uh, one of many different platforms, that these stories can come back to life and be told. Well, thank you, Ron. We're going to be joined now by Steve Leck. Uh, Steve is a historian. Uh, he hails from Riverside, California, which is the county seat of Riverside County and uh, Palm Springs, Coachella Valley, all that area uh, is, is part of Riverside County. Um, uh, Steve uh, has written 10 books, uh, at least 10 books to my knowledge, on a variety of topics related to Riverside County history. And this includes a publication that is widely considered to be the definitive history of Riverside County. It's, it's got a long title and it's called Along Old Roads, A History of the Portion of Southern California that Became Riverside County, 1772 to 1893. Uh, I also uh, uh, want to note that uh, Steve, I'm not Steve, maybe you can confirm. I know that you um, uh, served on the Riverside County Historical Commission and on the City of Riverside's Cultural Heritage Board. I, I'm curious if you still uh, uh, serve in those roles. Still do. Uh, all right. Uh, well, the essay that uh, Steve contributed to the book, Postcards from Mecca, is about the postcard business. and uh, he takes a look in that essay at uh, some of the other notable uh, postcard makers, photographers who turn their stuff into postcards. And um, uh, so he'll he'll take a look at, uh, I guess he's going to speak a little bit about Susie and Lula May's photography and how it's stacked up against the other, other folks making postcards. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please help in welcoming Steve Leck. All righty. Well, thank you. Um... I came at this obviously from a very different perspective. I'm a historian of Riverside County, and as part of my uh, collections, I have over 8,000 vintage postcards of Riverside County, and I uh, collect all kinds of ones, and I noticed these that were signed S.K. Smith, and I wanted to do some research into this person. I, of course, thought it was a man uh, initially, uh, not only because it was in the desert, but because just the way the, the name was uh, signed, S.K. Smith. Women typically did not sign their name that way. So, of course, I went off hunting and uh, immediately fell into the trap of trying to find somebody named Smith. Um, but eventually I was led to um, Anjapenga and, of course, then Warner and the rest of the gang here uh, who were doing the research uh, on it. And so with that, I joined the club and kind of took the perspective of their um, use of postcards. But um, first of all, I wanted to explain to you, uh, since you all are up in Northern California, where, um, where Mecca is and its significance. Because people think nowadays of Mecca is pretty much just a haven for um, agricultural workers. But it really was a main uh, main portion of settlement within the lower Coachella Valley. And this is a Google Earth uh, view of it. Here's the very northern part of the Salton Sea. Here's Mecca. And then here's where Susie lived. That was their ranch there. So just north of the Salton Sea. It was called the Triangle Ranch. And this is a view of it today. It's pretty much dedicated to row crops. 
uh, today, but you can see the uh, mountains down below. And if you could turn 180 degrees, there'd be mountains behind me too. So anyway, this is in the uh, Mecca area. Um, the father had wanted to come out here to do some farming. So that's why they moved out from uh, Los Angeles then. Uh, when Susie was the postmaster here at Mecca, she had access to all kinds of people, as both uh, Ron and Warner have, have alluded to, because this was the main hub of the Southern Coachella Valley. It was right on the main line of the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad, the second transcontinental railroad. And the Southern Pacific had found a huge amount of water, subterranean water here. So this became sort of a major place. And so she had access to railroad people, railroad workers, the um, surveyors for the canals, the prospectors, the desert explorers. She had uh, all kinds of people who she would have known coming through there not only because of her post office, uh, but she also had a little shop there where she sold magazines and postcards, of course, but also because she was directly right across the street from the railroad uh, station, too. And the main hotel there in Mecca was not too far away either. So she was really kind of in a, in a uh, unique place where she was here in the Coachella Valley, but then she had access to all the desert area um, out to the east and to the southeast also. Imperial Valley would be just to the southeast of, of all of this. And here, of course, she is uh, at her post office station there. And here's a couple of shots inside. These are literally post office boxes. You get your mail. Then notice our, our selection of postcards, our magazines, um all kinds of things and she was uh doing this during what's known as the golden age of postcards and you can't you have to look at postcards as two different things one of them of course is is a neat picture of something that you can send back to uh, you know uncle john and aunt mary uh of your travels and the like but they were also advertisements and if you think about it, a lot of people came out here to winter. They came out here for their health. And sending a picture like this back to your aunt and uncle who are living in a snow drift in Cincinnati or outside of Boston or so would be an enticement maybe to come out here to California. This is the northern part of the Coachella Valley. Um, this would be the beginning of Mount San Jacinto. Palm Springs would be down here, and this is an area called the Devil's Garden. It used to have all kinds of varieties of cactus uh, and the like in it. But she's coming into play here at this time, um, but most of the postcards, though, look like this at the time. And they started out as real photos, but they were tinted and retinted and re-retinted so that they almost have this kind of cartoonish look to them. And this is a Kurt Tyke photograph uh, or postcard, uh, probably the most prolific postcard publisher of the time. He was out of Chicago, uh, but he would import or take these pictures and then uh, send the postcards. And they're very typical of this time frame. But what was coming out of the desert from a number of different people are what we call real photo postcards. And uh, I think Ron alluded to it. She, they would take photographs and then they would uh, have them actually printed on postcard stock then, and it would give you a real photo. Now they were more expensive, but if you had a choice between this and this, most people would actually uh, opt for the real photo postcard. Uh, this was one of the most um, well-known of the photographers in the desert at this time, the teens and 20s, Stephen Willard. Um, he started in Corona, moved out to Palm Springs, and then eventually moved up to the Mammoth Mountain area then. But he came out and took uh, loads of pictures in the desert, including this. This is the iconic scene when you think of scenery in Riverside County. It's Mount San Jacinto, 
Um, there, it's about a third of the way um, from west to east uh, in the county, and it's the uh, it's the steepest escarpment I believe in the country. Uh, there is Mount San Jacinto. So uh, when you think of scenery, at least in our county, this is the one shot that usually comes to the forefront. So everybody took them. But this is a Stephen Willard uh, photo postcard. Uh, Burton Fraser was also another very, very prolific one. He's by far the most prolific of the photo postcards in Southern California. He was out of uh, Pomona, which is, um, oh, what's that, about 30 miles away from us or so. But he was in the business of taking lots of pictures and selling lots of postcards. And so his are very readily accessible. That is, you can go recreate this scene as I have and many of his other ones without walking more than maybe 50 to 100 feet off the road. Um, then they get out, take the picture, boom, I'm done. And there you go. Then. So Burton Fraser um, was a major mover and shaker in the not so much the 20s, but 30s, 40s, and into the 50s um, here. And this is the Coachella Valley. You can barely see, there's the Salton Sea. Here would be Mecca here. And this would be taken from uh, what's Joshua Tree today. And another one in our little neck of the woods was Dewey Moore. Dewey Moore had actually come out to the date experiment station in Mecca when they were trying different varieties of dates as an agricultural uh, crop, <coughs> excuse me. And he was actually their weatherman. But as a sidelight, he had a camera and he would go around and take pictures and sell postcards too. And they're usually uh, signed as uh, D. Moore there. And this is one of the more famous of the uh, roadside date stands here at Valerie Jeans, not very far from Mecca. In fact, it's just about maybe seven or eight miles west of it. So into this fray came Susie uh, and of course Lula May, and she opted for her own there. Uh, she of course had them made uh, in San Diego, but as you can tell by looking at these other ones here, her photography was every bit as good, if not better than some of the other ones that were being sold uh, here. She of course had the unique uh, opportunity though of having access to the railroad, ready access to the railroad, plus the post office there. And so for a while, her um, photographic postcards were being sold uh, all the way from Beaumont down to Yuma, which is probably about a 200 mile or so distance with Mecca about right, right in the middle uh, there. So she kind of had a ready market, if you will. Then, so this is um, a scene from near Valerie Jeans, and this is of course a lonely desert trail. And um, she liked the scenery ones; um, those tend to be the best sellers. Again, because there's something unique. And you think about it, most people in the United States still lived either in the mis Midwest or East Coast. So if you had spent all your life in Virginia or Boston or Cleveland, when would you have ever seen a desert scene like this? You wouldn't have. And so uh, this would be kind of an allure, if you would. So let's look at some of the other photographics uh, postcards uh, too that she did. Um, some of them were just as, as uh, Ron and Warner pointed out, just various scenes that she had seen in, uh, in and around the desert. An old log cabin here in Whitewater Canyon. Uh, this would be on the north end of the Coachella Valley. Where they got the logs is another story, but um, you know, there was that, and Whitewater Canyon is now a big preserve. You can hike in it. She loved the uh, photos of the people here. Um, this is a trail breaker of the Old West. And these people would be coming into Mecca. She would readily see them at her, her post office because they would come into town to resupply, get their mail, et cetera, and then head back out trying to reach gold in the desert. And uh, some of them got a little bit, but for the most part, uh, most of them went bust. 
This is the prospector in search of gold. Uh, this is in all likelihood Box Canyon, which acted as the main thoroughfare for the highway from Mecca out to the east part of the desert. In there. Here's another one. There's gold in Limdar Hills. And he's got his burrows and he's out there prospecting uh, too. And then here's even a little one. Give me my, my books and saddles, says the little boy with his little baby burrow here in the Coachella Valley. So she could get humorous too at times. The building of the canal, the All-American Canal was a big deal. That was uh, photographed by them, the surveyors, the construction crews, the uh, muckers coming out of the mountains, building the tunnels for this. This was a major undertaking in the very early 30s, the very depths of the depression. And it was a massive project that was met um, with a lot of fanfare in Riverside County because it was a big jobs provider at a time when uh, you know there weren't that many. It started in 1930, 31, 32 in that era. So, of course, she took pictures of the camps where they would um, live. This would be out in an area um, between, well, basically about where the Chuckwalla and Shaver Valleys are uh, there on the, on the true desert. Then she'd take a picture of the crews out here. This is the um, Camp Cooks there at that same camp. So she would have gotten to know them and, of course, probably come through periodically. And here's the day shift going into the uh, uh, tunnels to run the, the, pi uh, the pipes under the mountains there instead of taking them up and over. So these guys would have been in there digging away, blasting, et cetera, to get that canal through. As, um, as Ron said, she also took pictures of some of the uh, local Indian artifacts, including uh, these, the prehistoric writings on, um, this would be in a, it's actually a county park called Fish Traps Park, where uh, the ancient stone fish traps were just south of La Quinta, uh, where the exhibit started. And um, this was an area of that ancient Lake Cahuilla where there were stone fish traps. A lot of the rocks around there have these petroglyphs uh, in them. Uh, and then if she found other artifacts too, these would be of interest to people, not only for their document of uh, properties, but also just as, a, as something of interest. And so uh, you could get these and send them back home too. The intricate weavings of the baskets, the clay workings of the oyas for the water too. But I think above all, with Susie's pictures, not, not only is the photography uh, up to par, at least with the others, but her spots are spots that you really had to work to get to. Sure, she took some from the highway, but a lot of the time she was out there or they were out there exploring canyons that could take you, uh, you know, all day to get to, two or three days to get to. Um, Hidden Springs here, and this is Sidewinder Canyon near it. This was about a two mile hike out of Box Canyon. Box Canyon actually has a state highway going through it today, but if you want to get into Hidden Springs here, uh, you're looking at about a two mile hike over Hill and Dale uh, to get to it. Um, and uh, it's, it's just as beautiful then as now, but as, as I think Ron alluded to, she was taking pictures and perhaps with the idea of making postcards and perhaps just with the idea of having pictures and documenting uh, for her own edification. She was actually given the camera by an uncle who gave her the camera so she'd have something to do while she coalesced with polio because it was said that she would never walk again. And after about four or five years of surgeries and what we would consider physical therapy and the like she was able to get up and with that leg brace get around but it was thought for quite some time that she would pretty much be bedridden or at least wheelchair ridden that of course proved to not be true there 
Um, so this is one of the major uh, palm oases in, um, in the desert, not too far from Mecca, Dos Palmas. It's still preserved today. Here's the Salton Sea near where she was from the east. And then this is in Box Canyon, again, the highway heading out of Mecca, uh, there in the beautiful portions of the desert with all the smoke trees. And again, Mount San Jacinto from the Devil's Garden. And uh, <clears throat> as the other two presenters alluded to, this is these are great vistas of what things look like, because to recreate this shot today, you're going to have about 500 wind turbines all up and down all over here um there and of course if you take it <coughs> later at night they're all going to red lights on them because the airport is nearby etc cetera, etc cetera. but you see what it looked like uh before a lot of human activity there here's the uh thousand palms oasis right along the, the fault lines there, that's why it has so many palm trees. It is said that palm trees have to have their heads in the sun and their feet in the water. So you look for palm trees, that's where you're gonna find water in the desert. Here's Palm Canyon, which is a, still an attraction. You can go hiking there. And she even took pictures of flowers in the desert. And again, this would have been something unique too, because most people at the time thought pretty much everything east of, or excuse me, west of the Mississippi was just one long um open desert so anyways um look you could have flowers in the desert so that would have been unique so here's the clouds at sunset in the coachella valley and then finally our sunset at salton sea and this is a a very unique situation too having this massive lake in the middle of the desert where it's uh, typically been upwards of 120 of late. So anyways, um, that does it for my portion of it. Uh, again, here's the book uh, if you're at all interested and there are all kinds of other pictures and bits of information therein. So I will go ahead and do whatever I need to give it back to David. All right. Let's open my camera. And that's it. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. I, I have to ask you a couple of quick questions, though. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, you know, I, I noted that uh, the photograph of the one of the photographs of the interior of the post office, particularly the one focused on the magazine rack, the the number of magazines that are all about adventure and uh, sort of almost like Pulp Fiction or Dime Store novel. Material. Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. Well, um, again, she was catering to the traveling public on the railroad. Uh, so give, give them something to read as they were going uh, probably back east and also to a lot of the prospectors and others who were coming through. So she had a lot of those. And then really she kind of she and Lula May kind of took on that persona. Remember the pictures that uh, Warner showed us, you know, Lula Mae there in her nice little sundress comes out of Tennessee. And then all of a sudden, within a week, she's in these cowboy duds looking like she's been on the desert for years. And they kind of took on this persona of the the action heroes going through the harsh environments and uh, doing it with, you know, grace and, and ease. Um, it, the story that I like to tell too, because I'm I'm also into old cars, is you know they took their Model T out, and her father would not let her do that until she knew the Model T. So he took it apart underneath the, the tree one day and said, "Put it back together. Once you get it started, you can take it." And she got it put back together, and it cranked on the first crank. So she was nimble with the tools too, and also knew how to survive in the desert. I, I think her father also. Um... I gave her a revolver uh, to take out with her on her adventures out on the road. It was told to me that her revolver was either on her hip or on the counter there in the post office for 38. Okay. I also wanted to ask you, Steve, um, regarding post postcards, uh, how far back does the history of postcards go, the postcards as we know them today? 
as we know them today, with uh, photos on them and the like, you're probably looking at about 1900, hmm. right around there. Uh, there were postal cards before that, uh, where you could write a message and then the other side you could address it and, and go. But if you're looking for stuff with any kind of photos, drawings, stuff like that, maybe late 90s, but definitely by about 1900 on. And again, that 18, or excuse me, 1910s, 20s, 30s, that's really your golden era, uh, as we say. And that's when all these people were working at, and plus several other publishers too. Uh, lith lithography had been invented, and so you could get color eventually, like Kurt Teich uh, used. And of course, the photographic um, means were becoming much better that you could run off 100 or 200 copies on a photo postcard stock and then actually have a souvenir to send to. So there were all kinds, and then people kept them too. You know, they, they weren't, they weren't uh, you know, something that you kept for a day or two. This is what you kept as your own collection plus your stuff from your friends and, and relatives. I think in your essay in the book, you made a comment, I think, about uh, Frasher, um, one of the postcard makers. Uh, in his heyday, he was selling millions of postcards a year. He sold 40 million, I believe, in 1948. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so he, he had quite the operation, as you can imagine. And it wasn't just him. I mean, he had photographers working for him. He had a camera store and stationery store in downtown Pomona, but then he would go out and his beat was really the Southwest and Southern California, but he did get up into Northern California, Nevada and Arizona. And many of his uh, pictures of local Indians, especially in Arizona are just wonderful. That was kind of his big thing. Yeah, so. and of course we all, we all still see postcards and gift shops all over the country, but. I wonder if if uh, the advent of social media and Instagram have, for many people, replaced the actual physical postcard which you put in the mail. Probably will, and and it's been going on for a while because uh, as a postcard collector, it's actually the early ones that are the easiest ones to get. The ones from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, those are the rare ones, oh. just because the numbers of them went down so far as people quit using them. But the ones from the teens and 20s, uh, and of course, people kept them. So the ones from the teens and 20s are very readily available. Wow. Well, I, I would like to ask if uh, both uh, Warner and uh, Ron could rejoin us on the screen. Um, yeah, welcome back. Um, so I, I've been looking at the chat room. Really, no one has made any comments or posed any questions, so I'm going to put out a last call for the audience to do that. In the meantime, I, I want to give an op Oh, before we go any further, too, uh, all of you at one point or another mentioned Anne Hapenga, who is the co-editor of the book with Warner, and I just want to give a shout out to Anne, and I encourage you all to, to check out her website, her webzine, uh, you can find it at anhapenga.com, and I'm just going to spell that out for you, A-N-N-J-A-P-E-N-G-A. -N -N and she and I exchanged uh, some uh, emails together. I initially thought that she might be a part of this program tonight. She deferred to our esteemed guests here, but she was just so kind and gracious in her, in her email exchange with me. So... Um, I encourage you to, to seek her out at anhapenga.com. Um, well, I, I, this has been a, a very edifying evening, and I want to thank you all for participating in this. Uh, um, it's just, again, the, the big themes that I think, Warner, you said, the, the photographs of your grandmothers and Susie's really capture a period of time, a snapshot in time of a place that even though the desert in many areas doesn't change, the whole Coachella Valley looks a lot different today than it did back in Susie and Lula May's time. And it's wonderful to be able to see those images from that, from that time. Uh, any last thoughts uh, from any of our guest presenters that you'd like to share with the audience? 
No, I, I guess not. I mean, it's just uh, it's fascinating to be able to get the backstory on this, and I'm glad that I was a part of it uh, there because I had hoped to be able to find out something. Unfortunately, most of the photo postcards are not um, identified as far as a photographer is concerned. Um, so it's nice to be able to have that background information and that we actually have them. Um, uh, if you don't mind, and that is that the the albums that are in that Goff uh, Museum, whatever it is in Goffs, um, those were, you know, the, the black paper pages written in, in white ink. She carefully identified the, the two best albums. Every photograph has information, and a lot of those photos weren't intended to be and never were po uh, postcards. They were photos of people in her life, the places. Um, but as they say, in the early days, she wasn't thinking of postcards. They were serving the function of, you know, like historical documentation of her life. And those are the ones that I actually sent off without making copies of anything. And those are out there, but I've never bothered to go all the way out to visit them. Um, by the time I started getting really interested in this and making Im copies of images, those are the ones you saw in the, in the thing today. And, and the truth is, I don't know which ones um, Susie shot and which ones Lou LeMay shot. And Susie could have had Lou LeMay's photos in her collection because I didn't, I mean, it's not like anybody was trying to guarantee who was who. Do you know, Warner, do you know? Uh, no, in fact, uh, when I researched the photos out of Goffs, I was expecting to find a whole bunch of photos I'd never seen before. Um, but I'd say uh, at least 50% of them, if not more, are the same ones that are in my grandmother's collection. Um, and I, it's hard, it, it's really hard to tell who took which photo. Um, I mean, you can assume if Susie's in the photo, Lula took it and vice versa. But beyond that, it's really hard to, to know who took, they, they shared everything. They shared their photos, they shared all their negatives. Um, so it's hard to know. Another point I wanna make is that, that anything of value uh, I went down to that auction to try and get them, but I wasn't that, archeologists don't make real money. So there was a very big uh, box photograph, I mean, box camera made out of wood uh, and the tripod, I couldn't even begin to touch it. It went for over a thousand dollars. There were silverware. Uh, there were a lot of desert oil paintings, probably worth thousands, but there's no way I could get to them. Uh, one that, uh, the, the drawing of the bighorn sheep, that was in the trash can. Um, and that was actually done by um, the fellow at Corn Springs. I can't remember his name right now. Gus Letterer. Gus Letterer did that, yeah. And I gave that to Russ Kaldenberg and I assume that's in the collection, but I honestly don't know where it went. Um, I don't believe I have anything more. If I ever do find more that I squirreled away, it will all, you know, I'll get make sure you guys all get copies of it or I'll send it off to that museum as well. Warner, I, I want to ask you uh, the time you spent with your grandmother, Lula May. Mm -hmm. Do you think that she ever had an inkling that that these photos would have been kept and uh, been made public in, in the way that they've been made now? Any sense uh, that she had posterity? Yeah, she knew because um, starting probably about the 80s, she would have uh, people come out and interview her. Um, I don't know how people knew about her photos or about her time in the desert, but uh, Tom Patterson, a local uh, Riverside reporter, interviewed her several times. Um, uh, she, uh, her photos were used for uh, various books. Uh, so. I don't think she uh, expected it to be a book or a traveling exhibit, um, but uh, yeah, she knew people was interested in, in her material. I think she got a real kick out of it. It was a real delight. She was very surprised. Because uh, yeah, I think to her, her, her and Susie's time, um, you know, it's just a part of her life. She was surprised that people wanted to sit down and talk to her about it. Oh, okay. um, I, I, it bears mentioning as well, we've talked about the book a few times uh, and the many essays that are in it. But the book is also chock full of images. Uh, mm. There's a lot of wonderful photos, and uh, many of them uh, didn't make it into the, at least the traveling version of the exhibition. So I think for anybody interested in this subject, uh, 
buying a copy of this book um, will reveal a lot more images than you see in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting uh, now we're getting a lot of people weighing in in the in the chat room. I'm just going to mention a, a couple of them. Uh, Priscilla writes, just figured out how to send a message. Um, where'd you go there, Priscilla? Uh, I have fond memories of postcards from the Adirondacks where I spent summers as a teen. I now have a greater appreciation for them. Thank you all for your presentation. Uh, another uh, woman, Mary, is is thanking, thanks for dumpster diving and preserving this information. Um, uh, there's a question. Uh, uh, that's posed about uh, how did Lulu May find find her husband? We talked a little bit, or some of you've talked a little bit about uh, Susie's marriage, but what about Lulu May, Warner? Uh, she met my granddad. Uh, he was a Depression era prospector, uh, so he was one of the men who uh, courted uh, my grandmother out there in the desert. Um, so yeah, she met him um, in the uh, Chekawal wilderness. He was just one of many prospectors, I think, who were uh, courting both Susie and Lula, and uh, he, he went <laughs> yeah. out. Um, well, we're, I think we're, we've come up at 8.34, so we're way over time. Uh, mm -hmm. I suppose we could continue this conversation for, for quite a while. Um, but I, I, one last thing, though, uh, uh, well, maybe one of you can address it. Uh, Susie eventually moved away from the desert. And I, I want to say settled in uh, uh, somewhere in Escondido or someplace near San Diego. She, uh, she settled in Lucadia, Lucadia. Uh, there, which is by Encinitas. Um, and from what I understand, that had a lot to do with the fact that her polio had gotten the best of her uh, as far as the heat was concerned. Polio uh, suffers become rather intolerant of the heat. And so she spent the latter part of her life there in Lucadia. Although when she married, they were still traversing the desert. Uh, I don't know actually when she moved to Lucadia, but uh, um, that's where she was. Right. And um, did she uh, did she remarry after her, her first husband? Did she have another husband after no. that? Not to my okay. knowledge. Okay. I know she, she got very involved in um, uh, a church she was engaged in and did a lot of work helping out uh, farm workers and migrant farm workers, I believe. That's true. She did missionary work in Mexico and around too, yeah. There's actually quite a few uh, pages of photographs of those people and little notes and uh, you know grocery lists and things. Um, she was very involved with them. I, I'm sure she was fluent in Spanish, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. And there's names there. I mean, there's if you a historian could have a field day with that material there are letters and um you know documents and things you know all right well uh, we are getting lots of thank yous um panelists um uh, for your wonderful presentations and i think there's a strong running theme in all these comments about uh, the gratitude for preserving the history of both of these wonderful adventuring pioneering women and what it means in terms of all of us the the postcards and images that we save uh, from our family histories and whatnot how important those are and um again as a museum professional and a person who's overseen in archives in my time there's nothing better than discovering these little jewel jewels of people's stories they they really fill out the, the bigger picture of history so Thank you all again for joining us tonight. It's been a very special evening. Again, uh, we are recording this, and uh, probably in about a month we'll have uh, a cleaned up version of the of the um, recording to share on our website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, Ron May, Werner Graves, Steve Leck, um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been such a pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, thank you. So thank you again. Thank Good you. Night,